Hello again, everyone. In case you don't know me, my name is Brody Stewart, and I am a seminarian, meaning I am studying to become a Roman Catholic priest for the Archdiocese of Seattle. And here I am at St. Louis Catholic Church in Bellevue, Washington, on my pastoral internship year. And I'm in the midst right now as well of the coronavirus pandemic, as I'm sure all of you are well aware. So I've been using all of my abundant free time to record these sorts of videos for you, to share with you forms of prayer that I have found particularly powerful and meaningful, even from the comfort of my own home, but also to share with you the riches of our church, the riches of our faith. So in this particular video, what I would like to do is share with you something that's been very meaningful, very inspiring for me, and that is the fathers of the church. Anytime I talk about scripture, if you've ever heard me talking about scripture, you've probably heard me mention the fathers of the church. And you may have wondered to yourself, what does that mean? Who are the fathers of the church? Well, good question. I myself was curious about that when I was becoming Catholic. And even now, as, as a faithful Catholic studying to become a priest, it's a, an infinite wealth of, of theological riches. So I would just like to give you a foray into the Fathers of the Church here in this video, um, explain who they are, uh, give you some resources to look up yourself if you care to do further reading. So in terms of the outline of the video, I really like the outline used by Pope Benedict XVI in his book, Principles of Catholic Theology. This outline is you know, both logical, but also really inspiring and helpful. So I would like to share that outline with you as the, the format of this video, and I'll flesh it out as we go along with examples of my own. But that's the, uh, the outline. If you're curious, you can read his book, Principles of Catholic Theology. But that outline itself, here's the, the road map. Here's where we're going to go in this video. First question, what makes someone a father of the church? Now, there are four criteria. We'll come back to those momentarily. Second question, why study the fathers of the church? Also a good question. There are a number of reasons. I'll give you one dogmatic reason, one from church teaching, one very practical reason, and then four kind of theological, technical reasons that are all of them enlightening in some way. And then I'd like to conclude the video with just three examples of fathers of the church, three fathers of the church themselves who are personally meaningful, inspiring to me. So I just want to share how they have enriched me, share that with you. So that's how I'll, I'll conclude. But to begin with, let's just dive into the first question, I suppose. What makes someone a father of the church? Now, like I said, there are four criteria. The first of these four criteria is that their teaching is orthodox. Now, to say that somebody has orthodox teaching already presupposes that they have teaching, right? A body of teaching exists. Now, part of the reason that a body of teaching exists for them, the reason that their writings have been preserved, is because they were orthodox. That is to say, they were not a heretic. They taught faithfully. They taught luminously. They explained the faith in such a way that people cared to preserve it. So to be a father of the church, you have to have teaching that is orthodox. Now, the second criterion is holiness of life. Holiness of life. Now, that is not to say that they, the fathers, are necessarily saints. You don't have to be declared, canonized, a saint to be a father of the church. There's two examples that come to mind. Origin of Alexandria we'll come back to him. He was not declared a saint, even arguably condemned by one of the councils, although we'll not open that can of worms just yet. Not declared a saint, but he spent his whole life longing for martyrdom. His father was a martyr. He spent his whole life longing for the same fate. And he, even at the end of his life, was tortured ruthlessly because he would not stop professing the faith. So, there's no question of his personal holiness. And then the other example, Tertullian, a father of the church, but he was never canonized. Part of the reason he was never canonized is because arguably he's, he died out of communion with the Church of Rome. But 
he was a charismatic Christian and a, a rigorous ascetic. So nobody questioned his personal holiness, his commitment to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but he was never canonized a saint. Also worth noting that holiness doesn't just mean what we might think of when we say a holy guy right now. We, it doesn't just mean you're a nice guy, you know, you're super friendly and everybody likes you. One example, one father of the church, Jerome. Jerome is a saint even, a saint and a father of the church, not because he was a nice guy. I mean, he was sometimes scathing in the letters he wrote. He was very good at burning bridges. He had friends who, you know, the relationship with his friends he sometimes ruined based on what he wrote in letters. So by contemporary standards of like, who's a nice guy, Jerome was not that, but nobody would question his devotion to Jesus. He spent his entire life, uh, you know, writing works on scripture, devoting his entire life to studying the faith, studying the Bible, and sharing the fruits of that with other people, with a semi-monastic life. And he, he shared that with other people as well, shepherded communities. So to be holy is uh, to give your entire life to Jesus and the church. The fathers have to have that criterion. Third criterion, antiquity. So antiquity, what does that mean? It just means they're old. Now, okay, what exactly does that mean? Well, there's not an exact answer. There's no range of years in which everyone who lived then is considered a father. But there is some sort of general scholarly consensus on what constitutes antiquity. And, you know, essentially that's just from the apostles, the fathers of the church who immediately followed them, the apostolic fathers, up through more or less Pope St. Gregory the Great in the 6th and 7th century. When you get to him, you start to get uh, a culture, a church, that is more recognizably medieval. That is to say, it's decreasingly cosmopolitan. There's more divergences in terms of culture and political differences. Uh, the different Christian communities are splitting off because you know, Muslims are coming in and conquering parts of the empire and separating certain Christians from one another. So when you start getting this more fractured um, empire, this more fractured Christianity, that's when it becomes the Middle Ages. You see more differences between the fathers. So when we talk about the fathers of the church, they're fathers of a united Christendom. So basically from the year 50-ish up through the year 700. That's like a rough range for antiquity. Now the final criterion, the fourth criterion for being a father of the church is ecclesiastical recognition. That means a father is a father because the church said they're a father. Now again, like antiquity, there's no formal rules for that. There's no list of fathers of the church like there is a list for canonized saints and there's a list for the doctors of the church. The fathers of the church, uh, it's a little more loosey-goosey. But again, there is a sort of scholarly consensus on those people who are recognized as fathers of the church. When you have, for example, people like Pope Benedict XVI writing uh, a, a catechesis on a particular father, and calling him a father, that's a pretty good indication that the church regards him as a father if you know, the magisterium of the church is, is talking about this individual as a father. So those are the four criteria for what makes someone a father of the church. Their teaching is orthodox, they exhibit holiness of life, they are old antiquity, and ecclesiastical recognition, the church recognizes them as a father. So. Now that we know, you know what makes someone a father, we can move into the second question, which is why study the fathers? We have these guys who the church calls fathers. Why should we be interested in them? So I'll begin, as I said, with one dogmatic reason. And that is essentially, we study the fathers because the church told us to study the fathers. Now, if you're Catholic, 
that might be a compelling reason, right? You trust the church, you trust her teaching magisterium. If you're not Catholic, that might be not so compelling. So we have other reasons, stay tuned. But I will share the dogmatic reason nonetheless, because I think it, it expresses something beautiful. The church doesn't teach things arbitrarily. She teaches things because they're true, <laughs> because they make sense. So I'll share what the church teaches for all of our benefit. In the Council of Trent, um, and then repeated again in the First Vatican Council, so first in the 16th century and then in the 19th century, the church used this phrase when she was speaking about how to understand sacred scripture, how to understand the Bible. Now here's what the church said. No one is permitted to interpret sacred scripture contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers. Very bold, <laughs> direct language, right? No one is permitted to interpret sacred scripture contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers. Which is to say that the church's understanding of sacred scripture isn't arbitrary. It wasn't made up by some popes in the Middle Ages. The church's understanding of sacred scripture looks back to the fathers of the church, those who lived immediately after the apostles, and how all of them together in councils came together and hashed out what sacred scripture meant. So when we interpret scripture today, when we look at even how the church interprets scripture today, what we're really looking at is how the earliest Christians interpreted scripture. Not just one of them, not just like a fringe heretic, but all of them together when they came together in council and hashed it out. So that's a helpful way. <laughs> that's why we study the fathers because they point to what scripture really means. Now, maybe this bold direct language isn't your thing. So in the Second Vatican Council, this is 20th century now, the church rephrased this essentially in a, in a nicer, more persuasive way. So let me, let me also read this quote from the Second Vatican Council, the document Dei Verbum. The church says this, The spouse of the incarnate word, which is the church, is taught by the Holy Spirit. She strives to reach day by day a more profound understanding of the sacred scriptures in order to provide her children with food from the divine words. For this reason, she duly fosters the study of the fathers, both Eastern and Western, and of the sacred liturgies. Again, notice that connection between study of the fathers and understanding of sacred scripture. If we wish to understand scripture correctly, we have to study the fathers. And again, it's not just the fathers. They threw in a little addendum here. She duly fosters the study of the fathers, both Eastern and Western, and of the sacred liturgies. So not only can you not disconnect scripture from the fathers and how they interpreted it, you can't disconnect scripture from the liturgies, the the liturgies are the context in which the scriptures came about. The liturgies are the context that the scriptures are proclaimed in. So if we want to understand the scriptures, we have to understand their proper context, the sacred liturgies, their prayers, their movements. And, you know, by the way, guess who composed the texts of the liturgies? The fathers. The fathers composed the prayers used in the liturgies, which is the context for sacred scripture. So if you really want to understand scripture, then you have to understand the fathers of the church. There's this logical connection between scripture and the fathers and the liturgies. You can't separate any of them. So that's how, you know, the church understands the fathers and our need to study them. There's the, the dogmatic reason, if you will. Here's the practical reason. We study the fathers because they are the foundation for any authentic ecumenism. Now, ecumenism is just the relationship between Christian churches, small c churches, Christian groups, traditions, that you know we all acknowledge Jesus, Jesus as God. We believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? But there's differences in opinions um, all kinds of differences depending on the, the particular tradition that you're speaking about. But any ecumenical dialogue, what it does is it seeks not to just pick apart the differences and say, 
okay, you don't agree with me, you're a heretic, get out of here. Maybe in the past that was the approach that was taken because it was effective hundreds of years ago. Nowadays it's not very effective. So ecumenical dialogue, what we want to do is we want to come together and find our common ground. To look back to the fathers and to say, for hundreds of years, arguably 1500 years before the Protestant Reformation, or arguably a thousand years before the East-West Schism, or even look at the first six, seven centuries when there was literally only one church for the most part, and there was always going to be fringe heretics moving off, but when the church was one, when the church was united, when people even with cultural and linguistic and theological differences could still get together in councils and say, we are one church and we want to be on the same page. That's what the fathers did. So if we want to practice an authentic ecumenism today, we have to look to the fathers and follow their example, look to their teaching, find our common roots. That is the way forward. So if you care about ecumenism at all, you have to care about the fathers. It's very practical. Okay, that's the, the dogmatic reason, because the church said so, but also the practical reason, the ecumenical reason. Now I just want to give you four kind of theological reasons, four little tidbits uh, about the fathers, reasons you should care about the fathers. Again, these reasons come from Pope Benedict XVI, but they're perennially true. So. The first of these four theological reasons is that the fathers established the biblical canon. Now, what do I mean when I say biblical canon? That is, which books are really considered biblical? Which books do we talk about when we talk about sacred scripture? Canon there isn't, you know, like the pirate canon. It's a rule, the, the, the bar for sacred scripture, the measuring line. So in the first centuries of the church, this was, um, I should say the first decades really, this wasn't a huge topic of debate. All of the earliest Christians were Jewish converts, and so of course the Jewish scriptures were scripture for them. And then as the apostles established these early Christian communities, they began writing letters to one another, they began composing gospels to proclaim Jesus and to edify the Christians that they had already made, all these different, what we would call New Testament books now, just gradually, naturally cropped up. And so they started reading those in the liturgies too, alongside the Old Testament books. It was a very dynamic process, and the measuring line for what constituted scripture, the, the canon, if you will, was what are we proclaiming in the liturgy that we celebrate? What are we reading to encourage one another as Christians? Um, and for the, the earliest church, Old Testament plus this emerging New Testament. But after, you know, a hundred years or so, people started to get some weird ideas. So you have folks like Marcion, he's a, an early church heretic, and he, he was active in the second century. And he essentially started telling people that, whoa, 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 I'm a Christian here, guys, and guess what? As a Christian, I believe that there are two gods. There's like the wicked God of the Old Testament, the Demiurge. He created all of the physical stuff. We don't like that. And he's the reason, he's the one they talk about in those, all those violent, nasty Old Testament stories. Let's just throw those out. As a Christian, I believe in the God of the New Testament, who's, who is the father of Jesus. And he's like all nice and loving and merciful, and he has nothing to do with that Old Testament God. So my Bible, what I count as scripture, what we should be proclaiming in the liturgy, is eh, 10 of Paul's epistles, 10 letters from St. Paul, and also the Gospel of Luke. Oh, but by the way, let's edit out all the parts of the Gospel of Luke that refer to the Old Testament or sound kind of uncomfortable. So all of a sudden you have this guy saying, Christian scripture is 10 Pauline epistles and a hacked up Gospel of St. Luke. That was not the majority opinion. And so all of these fathers of the church got together and started saying, no, this is not what we believe as Christians. We believe as Christians that the Old Testament scriptures are still scripture, that indeed they foreshadow Christ, 
that they proclaim Christ, that Christ speaks through Moses and the prophets. It's not this wicked Old Testament God and then the good God of the New Testament. That's just crazy talk. So they had to get together and say, okay, which books are scripture? What is the canon, the biblical canon? And pretty quickly, they came to some sort of consensus. There was always little, little debates here and there. Um, but already by more or less the fourth century, St. Augustine in like the Synod of Carthage, for example, 397, St. Augustine already regarded the canon as closed. Like we've had this conversation, we've hashed out the details, these are the books of the Bible, okay? And that canon is recognizably what we call today the Catholic canon, 73 books of the Bible. Um, there's a contemporary debate now, hundreds, hundreds of years later, almost 2,000 years later, between you know, Protestants and Catholics. A lot of the time Protestants will say there's only 66 books of the Bible. Catholics will say there's 73 books of the Bible. And then those books that are in between, Catholics call them the Deuterocanon, and then sometimes Protestants call them the Apocrypha. I'm just going to set all of that aside for now. That's a very contemporary debate. When we look at the fathers of the church, the earliest Christians, we recognize that there was a lot more agreement on what constituted sacred scripture, on what was read and proclaimed in the liturgy. So the fathers of the church, they're the litmus test. What is the canon of the Bible? Well, you know, let's look at what the fathers say. So then that's the first reason, the first kind of theological reason that we study the fathers. Second theological reason, the fathers established what we call the rule of faith, the regula fidei in Latin, or in Greek, here's, here's a connection here, the canon tes pisteos. Notice again, canon, canon, it's the, the measuring line for the faith. What constitutes the, the authentic Christian faith? What constitutes orthodoxy? Now this, again, you know, nobody really thought about it at first, but when you start getting people pointing at the Bible and saying, I am reading the Bible as a faithful Christian, and I think that the Bible says that Jesus isn't God. He was created by God, and he's like better than us. He's like a superman, right? He's not a normal human, and he's not normal God. He's just like this in-between guy. For example, that was the position of Arius, a Christian priest. Arius was claiming this. Now, this is deeply problematic, right? Um, because if Jesus is not God, he can't save us. And if Jesus is not man, he cannot act as our, our high priest, a representative before God, right? So it's very important to the Christian narrative that Jesus be both God and man, fully both. So... There was a difficulty then, because Arius was pointing at the scriptures, the same scriptures that are proclaimed in liturgy, agreed upon as canon, and he's saying, this is where I'm getting my ideas. <laughs> now all of the, the fathers of the church had to come together and say, we got to hash this out, guys. This is ripping Christianity apart. What, how do we interpret the Bible? Who's to say? Who's the judge, right? Who will interpret the Bible? So what they do is they get together in council. So... For example, at the First Council of Nicaea in 325, this is what they did. They hashed out the Arian position. They said, this Arius guy is saying these crazy things. We can't believe that. What do we do? And you have folks like St. Athanasius, who is a father of the church, unlike Arius. And he argues vehemently for Jesus' full divinity. And in fact, as, as a product of the arguments of St. Athanasius and, and other bishops, other fathers who were there at the council, we get what we have today as the Nicene Creed. Um, we can call it a symbolon in Greek, this, like, this document of all these, these decrees, these um, doctrines that are thrown together and presented as one cohesive whole. We call it a creed based on the Latin credo, which just means I believe, which as you know is the first two words right, of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and so on. I'm not going to say the whole creed here, but that is the product of all of the fathers coming together in council and establishing a rule for the faith, a rule of faith that says, this is what we have to believe as Christians. This is how we have to interpret the Bible to be faithful. We have to follow this narrative of 
of the Christian story in order to understand the scriptures correctly. And the fathers are the ones who teach us how to do that. They're the ones who give us the creed. Yeah. So that's the second theological reason, like I said, um, why study the fathers? Because they established the biblical canon and because they established the rule of faith. Here's the, the third theological reason. They established the liturgy, the liturgy, the mass. <laughs> They're the ones responsible for it. Now, I should you know, qualify that statement. It's not technically correct to say that they created the mass. And, you know, Jesus created the mass. The eternal mind, the logos of God created the mass. So if you want to know where the mass came from and its Jewish roots and how the early church kind of developed it organically, I refer you to my video on the mass and the divine liturgy. Uh, you'll find all the answers there. But in terms of the structure of the mass, we have that kind of arising organically, but the texts and prayers of the mass, obviously somebody had to write those, right? Well, guess who wrote those? The fathers of the church. So for the texts of the Mass, mostly speaking about the Eucharistic prayer, because that's kind of the center of the Mass, that's the biggest, longest prayer, right? In the East, they call it the anaphora. Those prayers were composed by the Fathers. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, of Fathers and the texts that they are responsible for that are still recognizably in use today. So first example, we have this document from the third century in Rome called the Apostolic Tradition. Now, it's commonly, traditionally uh, ascribed to um, St. Hippolytus of Rome. Now, there's debate about whether or not Hippolytus of Rome actually wrote this document. But we point at this and say, look, this is the product of the fathers of the church composing this document detailing the liturgy as it's celebrated in Rome in the third century. And it includes a Eucharistic prayer, an anaphora. And this Eucharistic prayer contained in this third century Roman document, composed by arguably a father of the church, is, well, I shouldn't say still in use today, but at, after the Second Vatican Council, they composed a number of Eucharistic prayers that were sanctioned for use in the liturgy. And now what we have as Eucharistic Prayer II is actually based upon that anaphora, that Eucharistic prayer found in Hippolytus's apostolic tradition. So we look back to this third century document and say, look, the liturgy that we celebrate today is based on that prayer that was penned and preserved since the third century. That's what we have on the Western side, one example. Now on the Eastern side, two examples here. In the fourth century, St. Basil, tremendous father of the church in the East, huge, I won't go into that uh, right now, but he penned a number of anaphoras, apostolic prayers, or uh, Eucharistic prayers, and those Eucharistic prayers, those anaphoras, are still used today in the East. Those liturgies written by this father of the church, St. Basil the Great, are still in use today in the Eastern churches. And even more prominently, here's the third example, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. He was a father of the church, the fourth and fifth centuries, if you go to any Eastern Orthodox divine liturgy today, um, or any Byzantine Catholic divine liturgy, you will almost certainly hear, experience this liturgy. The texts that St. John Chrysostom himself wrote are still in use today. Isn't that mind-blowing? Fourth, fifth century father of the church, and we're still praying his words. Yeah, it's mind-blowing to me at least. And then one final example, and this one, this one just tickles me. I love this example every time I experience it. The Liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified Gifts. This is an Eastern liturgy. If you go to a, an Eastern Orthodox church or even a Byzantine Catholic church during the season of Lent, you will experience this pre-sanctified liturgy. Pre-sanctified just means that the gifts or the, you know, the bread and the wine are consecrated at an earlier time. So there's no celebration of the Eucharist per se during Lent in the Eastern churches. So this is essentially what we think of today as a communion service. But the fun fact about this particular liturgy, this liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, celebrated still today in Eastern Christianity, 
It was composed, at least traditionally as ascribed to, Pope St. Gregory the Great. That is, Pope of Rome in the 6th, 7th centuries. The last of the fathers, right? Even today, the Eastern churches, even some of them, they don't like the West very much, they still celebrate this liturgy composed by a Roman Pope, uh, at least traditionally ascribed to this Roman Pope. They still celebrate it. And in the course of the liturgy, there is a prayer for Gregory, Pope of Rome. Every time I hear that, even in an Orthodox church not in communion formally with Rome, my, my heart is warmed because even today in our liturgy, we look back to the time at which we were unified, when we were one church and there was no schism, there was no formal division. The fact that we pray these liturgies, that they've survived so long, is a testament to what is possible. Union is possible if we return to our roots, if we look back to the fathers. So that was the third theological reason for studying the fathers. And fourth and final theological reason now. The fathers established theology as a discipline. Now, theology, just etymologically, that means study of God, right? As a discipline, what that does is we basically build upon philosophy. So philosophy is love of wisdom. You know, you're using your mind to study the created world, to study logically first principles and, and extrapolate from there in order to find, to discover, to take hold of truth, wisdom, the mind of God. Add to that the data of divine revelation. That's something that we couldn't do on our own by our own lights, just looking at the created world. Now all of a sudden we have divine revelation. We can apply that mental discipline to God himself and how he has revealed himself, especially in the person of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what the fathers did is they, like I said, took philosophy, that whole discipline, and applied it to divine revelation. So I think it's important to keep in mind that what they're doing is not just an empirical picking apart, but it's a pursuit of the mind of God, a pursuit of who God is, because we love him. Philo philosophy, philosophia, love of wisdom. If we do theology, we're doing it because we love God and we want to know him. So the fathers, they turned their rational faculties to studying this, confident that it wasn't going to end up just this myth that they could dismiss, but that they would actually discover more of who God is by studying him with their mind. So what they did is they didn't pull any punches. So in some sense, um, again, we talk about science and these kind of contemporary scientific studies of things as a a reductionistic sort of worldview, where we pick it apart and we dismiss all these alternate explanations for things. But theology, it expands our minds the more we study. Um, so the fathers, what they're doing, like I said, they're, they're clinging to that revealed, the, the divine self-revelation. They're clinging to the truths that they have received from God, especially the apostles, you know, clinging to their experience of the God-man Jesus. And then the fathers following the apostles are clinging to what they have received from the apostles because it is divine revelation. They, that is the gift that God handed on to the apostles to hand on to the whole world. So they're clinging to that, but also they're bearing, they're bring, bringing all of their intellectual gifts and, and rational scrutiny to bear on that data. So one, one just example of how scholarly uh, some of these fathers were. Origin of Alexandria, again, we'll come back to him again. He composed or really aligned this, what's called the hexapla. What this was, was six columns. Column one, entire Hebrew Old Testament. All of the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew. Okay, that's significant in the ancient world. How does somebody write all that down? Column two, the Hebrew text transliterated into Greek characters. Okay, again, significant. The next four columns, 
four different translations of the Hebrew text into Greek. Origen, without the help of a computer, without the help of a printing press, somehow threw together this monumental project, six columns of the entire Hebrew Old Testament. I have no idea how he had, had the time for such a thing. I don't know how I would do that with a computer. But Origen wanted to know what the Bible said. He wanted to be faithful to the Hebrew text. He wanted to know those words that God revealed to the Jewish people, to Moses and the prophets. He was not sweeping things under the rug because they were difficult or uncomfortable or he couldn't find the answers. He would go to any length to know what God spoke to man. And then you have other fathers. Um, Origen was one of these uh, apologists. So you have folks like St. Irenaeus or um, Justin Martyr. They were taking the gospel. They were taking this Christian narrative, this Christian way of life, and going into new context saying, okay, we have these people who are, are Jewish who are attacking us because we've kind of like stolen their scriptures and we're blaspheming God. How do we defend ourselves against those claims? We have these people over here, the pagan world, that are saying, look, we, <laughs> we're the ones who came up with philosophy, so what you're saying is nonsense. Uh, and in fact, you're not sacrificing to all of these gods that we believe exist and that's probably the reason that all these natural disasters are occurring. So you better get on board with our gods. You better get on board with our philosophy. So you have the apologists saying, no, if we want to defend ourselves against all these attacks from outside, we have to explain rationally in a way that each of these groups can understand in their own terms what we believe as Christians. So the fathers did that. You know, they came up with ways to do that. The way that we engage in the world as Christians today the fact that we even have apologetics as a discipline, as a sub-discipline of theology, is because of the fathers and their example. So anytime we are doing theology today, we have the fathers to thank for that because they pioneered the discipline, but also they are our models. They did it so well. We can look back to how they did it and learn something from that. So there's the, all the reasons why we study the fathers. Again, the, the four, you have the dogmatic reason, I should say six really. Uh, the dogmatic reason, which is the church says so, the practical reason, the ecumenical reason, and then because the fathers established the canon of scripture, the rule of faith, they composed the texts of the liturgies, and they instituted theology as a discipline. So there's all these reasons to study the fathers, okay? So at this point, what I would like to do is to continue fleshing this out, just give you three examples of particular fathers that I have been moved by, that really speak to me, that stand out to me as good you know, personal examples. So the first of these personal examples is Saint Ignatius of Antioch. Not to be confused with Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, Saint Ignatius of Antioch. He was born around the year 50 AD, and he died in the early to mid-2nd century. So just to put that into perspective, 50 AD to 120-ish, that is the entire duration of time that the New Testament was being composed. He was alive as the New Testament was being written. He was eventually ordained as the Bishop of Antioch, immediately after this guy named Evodius. Again, for perspective, Evodius was appointed Bishop of Antioch immediately after St. Peter. So St. Peter, of course, as we know from the scriptures, established this church in Antioch. And then when he goes to Rome, you know, eventually to die there, right? His successor, Evodius, is named. And then when Evodius passes away, St. Ignatius of Antioch is named as Bishop of Antioch, hence you know, the name Ignatius of Antioch. These are the circles that St. Ignatius is running in, right? Only twice removed from St. Peter himself. But also, St. Ignatius of Antioch, it's you know, traditionally believed that he studied under John the Evangelist, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, 
the only one who was not martyred, right? John the Evangelist was the teacher of St. Ignatius of Antioch. So when I found out that St. Ignatius of Antioch not only existed, but he had seven surviving letters to the earliest Christian communities, my mind was blown. All of a sudden, there's a direct link, a direct historical link between the apostles, the ones who wrote the New Testament, the ones who lived with Jesus, and what we might des describe as like a contemporary Catholic teaching. Especially things like the Eucharist, our belief about the nature of the Eucharist as the body and blood of Jesus, uh, the role of a bishop in the early Christian community, apostolic succession. These sorts of things, when you read Ignatius's letters, sound pretty Catholic. And in fact, they were instrumental in my conversion to the Catholic faith when I discovered how the Apostolic Fathers, and Ignatius in particular, spoke about the faith. One line I just want to quote for you from um, his letter to the early Christian community in Rome. As he was on his way to Rome to be martyred, you know, thrown into the Colosseum and devoured by lions, that was his fate. As he was on his way there, he wrote this letter to the Christian community there saying, don't stop them from martyring me. I want to give this witness for Jesus. Like he gave it for me. Who am I to deny that to him? And this is what he said. I am the wheat of God and let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. Now that line has always struck me as particularly beautiful because one, just that witness, that willingness to give one's life in martyrdom is, is amazing. It's moving. But the, the language he uses is Eucharistic language. I am the wheat of God. Let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. The same Eucharist, the same bread of Christ that he has been receiving in the liturgy as a Christian, as a bishop, that same Eucharist that has been transforming him more and more into Christ, transforming his entire community more and more into Christ as a corporate unity, that same Eucharist has given him the strength to give his life as a witness, and in giving his life to be transformed into Christ in the most supreme way. That connection between Eucharist and martyrdom always, always moved me even the first time I read it. Now, if you would like to continue to read more about St. Ignatius, I would recommend that you go look up his letters. They're easily accessible online. Just Google St. Ignatius of Antioch Epistles, and you will find all seven letters surviving, in English translation even, um, accessible freely on the internet. So I, I recommend those to you because not only are they short, <laughs> they're also great reading. So I, I commend those to you. Now the second example, the second father of the church that I wish to share with you, I promised I would come back to him, Origen of Alexandria. He was born around the year 184, so this is second century. When he was 17, his father was arrested and then soon after martyred. So Origen he was raised in a very faithful Christian home. When his father was in prison, Origen wrote him a letter and said, Dad, don't deny Christ this witness. Like, submit to martyrdom. What a glorious example you will leave for me and for the whole Christian church. And of course, his father did submit to martyrdom. So Origen, his whole life, was super faithful. He himself desired mar martyrdom, ardently desired to be martyred, to give that witness to Christ. And even though he himself was not able to give that witness because the Romans didn't come in and kill him, he spent his entire life in service to Christ. Um, he had a, an amazing intellect. He was, even as at a young age, shortly after his father was martyred, he had already become a world-renowned catechist, uh, a philosopher, a theologian, even a preacher. He was invited, before he was ordained a priest, he was invited by bishops to preach in some of their churches because he was so well-known and his theology was so luminous. 
So eventually, it takes until he's 47 years old before he's ordained a priest in Caesarea. And even at that point, he continues writing on the scriptures. He continues preaching. He continues um, being internationally recognized as a, an authority on Christian interpretation of the scriptures. He eventually died when he was 69 years old because the, the Romans finally got him, right? They came in and he would not submit to um, their, <laughs> he would not sacrifice to the gods. He would not uh, recant from his Christian teaching that he dedicated his whole life to. And so they brutally tortured him. They did not give him that grace of martyrdom, but he did die three years later, as, presumably as a result of his, his brutal torture. So he himself would have willingly underwent martyrdom, but he was not given that, that grace. So while he was still alive and teaching, his theological contribution was massive. He wrote hundreds, hundreds of biblical commentaries and homilies on the entire Bible. Like I said, he was internationally renowned as an authority on how to interpret these scriptures. People would write him letters asking him to compose more works to explain things. Now, very unfortunately, most of these works, this, this massive corpus of, of Christian literature, uh, it is destroyed <laughs> because at the Second Council of Constantinople, about 553, uh, 300 years or so after Origen's death, he was questionably condemned as a heretic. Um, I won't get into all the details, but essentially there were a bunch of monks that were espousing some heretical ideas, and they said, oh, don't blame us. Uh, we found that stuff in Origen. He's our teacher. If you want to complain about anybody, complain about Origen. And so the, the powers that be at the time were so sick of that kind of thing happening that they essentially declared Origen a heretic and had many of his writings burned. Now, if you look at the actual acts, the texts of the council's de uh, decrees, Origen's condemnation isn't actually there. But still, many bishops got the impression, at least, that he was condemned. And so they did indeed destroy many of his works. That's one of the greatest tragedies in the history of Christianity, really. Thankfully, though, many of his works have been preserved, either in fragments, Greek fragments that survive, or in Latin translations that survived. So, blessedly, we still have an, uh, a window into his vision of the scriptures through these surviving works. Now, essentially, in these works, his teaching, uh, his, the whole point of what he's trying to accomplish is that there is a unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Like I said, uh, flashback to Marcion, right, who said that the Old Testament, that's not scripture, that's the bad, evil God of the Old Testament, and then there's a the good God who gives us the New Testament. Origen you know, vehemently opposed that sort of understanding. And so he spent his whole theological career turning his attention to the Old Testament and um, illuminating Christ present there already. He had this idea that we as faithful Christians today cling to still because of origin, that the eternal logos of God, the, the, the reason, the mind of God, is equivalent to Jesus. You know, that eternal logos took flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And then that same eternal mind of God is revealed, it takes flesh in a different sense, you could say, in the scriptures, even the Old Testament scriptures. The mind of God is making himself known to us as a man and in words, <laughs> the word of God in words. So when he read the Old Testament, he would do everything he could to just break it open and show people how the mind of God was being revealed, how Christ was present in a hidden way. So even the, the passages that were particularly uncomfortable that caused Marcion distress, things like the book of Joshua, you hear about Joshua going through and essentially annihilating these seven people groups, you know, genocide. That's pretty uncomfortable, right? How do we read that sort of historical narrative as a Christian? Well, we have to approach it with this idea that if it's scripture, if it's inspired, if the Holy Spirit spoke through the historical author to reveal some deeper truth about God, about Christ, then we have to look, we have to pay attention, we have to 
encounter Christ there or else our belief, our teaching is inconsistent. So one of the things he did, one of the ways he did that was he looked at the name Joshua. In the Greek, the name Joshua is Jesus. I hope that sounds familiar because in the Greek, the name Jesus is Jesus. And so he said, okay, that that name of Jesus, the name of my Lord, that name that is above every other name, where do I first hear that? I first hear that in the book of Joshua. Now, what does he do in the book of Joshua? He mows down all these enemies of Israel, right? He, he kicks them out of their own land and lets Israel inherit that land. It's like, we can't interpret this as just like this bloodthirsty violence. That's not how we as Christians view the world. That's not how we as Christians approach the scriptures. We as Christians see a spiritual sense that speaks to us even more so than it might have to the historical author. We see Jesus coming into our soul, kicking out all the demons that dwell there, all the vices that we've affixed ourselves to, in order that he may inherit our our souls, that he may take possession of our hearts. That's the reality that the Holy Spirit wishes to accomplish in us as we read those scriptures. So when we approach scripture in the same way that Origen approached scripture, we are encountering Christ. It's a prayerful experience, which is basically Lectio Divina, that divine holy reading. We have Origen to thank for Lectio Divina. So if you enjoy reading the scriptures, if you've ever encountered Christ in a powerful way as you've read or heard the scriptures proclaimed, thank you, Origen, Origen of Alexandria. He taught the church how to read the Bible, and we still cling to that today. Now, if you wish to do some further reading yourself of Origen's theological works, I would especially recommend any of his homilies. If you could find his homilies on the Gospel of Luke, or on the book of Joshua, or on the Song of Songs. Those are very good introductions, inspiring, moving introductions to his theology. Um, Sometimes those are harder to find because they only exist in kind of scholarly published books that are rather expensive. If you don't have access to a library that has those books, you can also look at his commentary, the surviving fragments of his commentary on John. That is readily accessible online in English translation. So if you Google origin commentary on John, you should be able to find that. And that's a good introduction to how he reads the scriptures, how he does theology. Now, we come to the final example that I wish to share with you, an example of a father of the church that has moved me. St. Augustine. You've almost certainly heard of St. Augustine, especially if you live in the West. He was born around the year 354. He died in 430. So it's 4th, 5th century. He was raised in his youth by a very pious Catholic mother, St. Monica. I'm sure you've heard of her as well. But his father was pagan, and both of them really wanted him to have a promising career because he was a bright guy. So they wanted him to have a promising career. And unfortunately, they never baptized him. Because at the time, there was this understanding that after their baptism, you, weren't, you really couldn't repent. There was no um, widespread practice of confession yet. So they were scared that he would get embroiled if they baptized him. He would get embroiled in the political world, and his soul would be lost. So Augustine later laments this fact that he was not baptism, baptized because, because he was not baptized, he ended up getting embroiled in uh, other things, the same types of things that every young man gets embroiled in. And at the age of 17, he had this affair with a young woman, and this affair resulted in the birth of a son. So this is just a series of tragedies, really, because after Augustine probably would have remained faithful to this woman, married her, raised the son, but it got in the way of his political career, his promising career. Um, So he was convinced actually to abandon this woman and take along his son and and pursue his his political aspirations. So all this time, he was not baptized and he ended up getting embroiled in a, a heretical sect, the Manichees. We'll come back to that in a second. And he, he basically, he lived this secular hedonistic life Um, eventually (laughs) heretical Christian life, and he didn't become Christian 
until he encountered another saint, another father of the church, St. Ambrose. So when Augustine heard St. Ambrose preaching, he was blown away. He realized, oh wait, Christians can be smart. (laughs) Christians can be reasonable. This Christian message that St. Ambrose is preaching is attractive and makes sense of my experience. Oh, (laughs) maybe I, I I dismissed this whole Christianity thing a little bit too quickly. So he eventually becomes Christian because of the preaching of St. Ambrose. And fun fact, that preaching of St. Ambrose, his way of reading the scriptures and expounding upon them, he himself learned from Origen. (laughs) That style that St. Ambrose employs is the style that Origen developed. So there's this thread from Origen to Ambrose to Augustine. And you see that in his later writings, this spiritual reading of the scriptures that's rich and beautiful and applies to us deeply today as Christians. Now, after Augustine's conversion to Catholicism, he was 31 when he converted. He was ordained a priest when he was 36 because uh, shortly after he converted to the faith, his mother, St. Monica, died, and then his son tragically died as well. So those, in the providence of God, those two tragedies enabled him to respond to his true vocation to to priesthood. And so he did. He gave his life to God in that way at the age of 36. And because he was such a a great mind, and because he was so faithful, such a spiritual man, at the age of 40, four years after his priestly ordination, he was ordained a bishop uh, in Hippo, North Africa. So as he was a bishop, this, this, his great, um, as, so as a bishop, not only was he pro- profoundly spiritual, um, deeply uh, intellectual, he was a good administrator too. And he had to deal with a lot of huge controversies, <laughs> an unfair amount of huge controversies. But they, the, the way he dealt with those controversies has la- left a lasting theological legacy for us today. So, I'm going to give you the real short spark notes version of those three controversies. The first against Manichaeism. Like I said, he used to be a Manichaean. Essentially, Manichaeism was similar to Marcionism. It's this sort of Gnostic worldview where there's the uh, evil is its own infinitely powerful force and good is its own infinitely powerful force and they're constantly at war with one another and then the evil force or God or whatever you want to call it created matter and then the good God is really spirit and he, he invites us to escape from our prison bodies and, and liberate ourselves from evil matter. That's not the Christian narrative, obviously. So what Augustine, when he, what, what he said basically as he was dealing with the Manichaeans, the Manichaeans, he said there's not two gods, the good God and the evil God, there's one God and he is good. And he is the God who created the physical world. So therefore, the physical world is good too. That means that when we talk about evil, we're not talking about this like eternal force. We're talking about a privation of good. We're saying evil doesn't really exist. Evil is just that space that is left when there should be something good there, but there's not. So that's the way we we talk about evil today. That's the way we understand evil in the Christian tradition today because of folks like Augustine, because of the fathers of the church. The second controversy that he had to deal with in his tenure as bishop was against the Donatists. This idea of Donatism is, especially in this context where the church is being persecuted, many priests and bishops, they capitulate to persecution. They hand over the sacred books that are used for liturgy. They hand over the scriptures to be destroyed. And then after that, they regret what they've done, and they come back and say, they were torturing me. What else could I do? I was scared. Like, I didn't mean it. I don't want to to live condemned to hell. I don't want to live apart from the church. What can I do? And the Donatists would say, sorry, man, you're out. Like, there's no forgiveness. <laughs> in fact, the sacraments that you celebrate, even if you're ordained a priest and a bishop, you can't celebrate them anymore because they're not valid, because you are a sinner. You're not holy enough to celebrate the sacraments. Now, obviously, that's a problem if Christians, if faithful Christians, are deprived of the sacraments because their priest or their bishop isn't holy enough. Augustine realized that was a problem, and he said that 
It's not this holy, saintly priest or bishop that makes the sacraments effective. It's Christ himself working in the priest, working through, speaking through the priest or the bishop. So essentially he was guaranteeing Christ's promise to be present. I will, you know, I, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He was guaranteeing that promise to all the faithful Christians, wherever they may be, whatever kind of priest they may be, even if that priest is a sinful, terrible priest, Christ is still acting through him to make the sacraments valid, present in the lives of believers. And then the third kind of theological controversy that Augustine left an impact um, by addressing was Pelagianism. He had to fight against Pelagius, and his essential doctrine was that there's no such thing as original sin. We're just born into this state of you know, general goodness, and all we really need is a good example to show us the way to perfection, and then we can get there on our own. So he says that Jesus, he's not a savior, he's just like a good example. We just follow his example, and then we make ourselves perfect. Problem solved. Now, Augustine says, okay, first of all, that's not even true to human experience. Just look at how we live left to our own devices and tell me that we're, <laughs> we're totally fine. Wrong. But also, what about Jesus? Like, if we believe that, Jesus is basically meaningless. The whole Christian narrative, that rule of faith, right, is basically nonsensical. We, as we, we have to acknowledge that we need a savior, that Jesus is both God and man, that he acts as God, as our savior, and man as our representative before divinity. That is an entirely crucial distinction um, to preserve what the church has always believed about Jesus, his, his divinity. Uh, to use a contemporary example too, um, when we talk about the state into which we are born, because original sin is a very difficult term, there's all kinds of debate about the nature of original sin. But just to help everyone understand the, the legacy that was left by Augustine, original sin doesn't mean that we're all terrible people, wicked, evil people, condemned to hell from the moment of our birth. What original sin means is that Adam and Eve, our first parents, sinned. They made a mistake. And therefore, we, all the way down the centuries, are born into the world kind of like babies who are addicted to drugs, right? It wasn't our fault as babies that we were addicted to drugs, but when we're born, we are born into a disordered reality. We are born in such a way that if we aren't helped, bad things will happen, right? We need, we need a savior. We need somebody to nurse us back to health. So when we talk about original sin and this, this legacy of St. Augustine, we're just talking about a rejection of Pelagianism, saying we need a savior and Jesus Christ is that savior. All right, here's your further reading for Augustine. His Confessions. That's just the title of the book. It's a spiritual autobiography. So Augustine himself wrote this book called Confessions to describe his own life, the narrative of his life, his conversion, his experience of God. This book, why I recommend this book to you and to everyone, is because it's beautiful. Augustine is, is a great thinker, spiritually profound, but it's so relatable. Based on what I told you already about Augustine's life, that could happen today, right? A young man gets all coiled up in sexual immorality and the ways of the world, has a, a son out of wedlock, encounters Christ through the profound, powerful preaching of St. Ambrose, eventually has a radical um, you know, conversion, and then vocation to the priesthood, to episcopacy. All of this is like stuff that happens today, right? I am a convert to Christianity and the Catholic faith. I can see myself in many ways in Augustine. So in this book, when you read it, it's a page turner, really. As long as you're reading a contemporary translation, it's, um, it's a very human, very human book, but it's a very good portrait of God's activity in the human soul, in one amazing human life. So I really encourage everyone to read Augustine's Confessions, and you will be hopefully moved as, as much as I was when I read it. 
So there you have my three recommended fathers. If you want to know about more fathers, because there are more than three of them, here's my next recommended reading, okay? The uh, series of catecheses that Pope Benedict XVI offered on the fathers of the church. They are readily accessible online, but they're also published in a two-volume book as well. Those catecheses are excellent introductions to individual fathers. If you have one father that you're curious about, Benedict XVI walks you through in a very scholarly but also very inspiring way the essentials of their life uh, and their teaching and kind of a prayerful, inspiring example for us today. So that's, that's my first piece of, of recommended reading. But then my last piece of recommended reading that I would just like to close this video with is the Liturgy of the Hours. There was another video I produced about the Liturgy of the Hours. If you don't know what that is, I refer you to that video. But in the Liturgy of the Hours is a particular hour called the Office of Readings, or Matins, or Vigils. But in, in the Roman contemporary version, it's called the Office of Readings. Now, in this Office of Readings, there's always two longer readings, one from Scripture and one from the Fathers of the Church. This, this resource, this form of prayer that the church proposes, this was my foray into the Fathers of the Church. Reading these relatively short, digestible, less than a page long, sometimes snippets from the best selections of all the fathers, they opened my mind to what theology can look like, what biblical commentary can look like. They helped me understand the Bible passages that I was already reading. And they you know, opened my heart to want to study theology. They, they sparked something in my soul. So that is what I would like to leave you with, a recommendation to yeah. nibble away at the fathers, to, to just probe bits and pieces here and there and, and expose yourself to them so that through their writings, through their theological vision, that you too can catch a glimpse of what they saw, that you too can encounter Christ in the scriptures, that you too can be moved to do in our time what they did in theirs.